Time is running short. It's running very short. And uh, that it is only Lord, the Lord in His mercy that is holding back those winds of strife. Over the past two weeks, we have been revisiting 1888. And last week, we read a particular statement, several particular statements, that intimated that the message of 1888 was a message, if received as God intended, would have done a very quick work. A very quick work. And uh, <coughs> I referred to this quote, and I want to read it to you here just now. It comes from the General Conference Bulletin, 1892, May 7th. It's interesting, this one was actually never published. You will not find it on the CD-ROM. And here Sister White wrote, I saw that Jones and Wagner had their counterparts in Joshua and Caleb as the children of Israel stoned the spies with literal stones of sarcasm and ridicule. I saw that you willfully reject what you know to be truth just because it was too humiliating to your dignity. I saw some of you in your tents mincing and making all manner of fun of these two brethren. I also saw that if you had accepted their message, we would have been in the kingdom in two years from that date. But now we have to go back into the wilderness and there stay 40 years. Two years from the date that the message was first given in 1888, they would have been in the kingdom. And as we understand last day prophecies and the outpouring of the plagues and close of probation, that would have given just one year for their message to perfect a people, to stand in the day of God without an intercessor. It <coughs> would have need to have been a very powerful message. And as we looked at last week, we saw that the testimony of the Spirit was that the church had been preaching the law, the law, until they are as dry as the hills of Gilboa. And... Uh, A.T. Jones, in 1893, made this particular statement regarding the law and the entrance of the law and the purpose of the law, something which the Adventist church in 1888 had not fully understood, as had not the Israelites at Mount Sinai. And here in the General Conference Bulletins, 1893, he stated this. Now let us see the whole story. The law entered that the offence might abound in order that we might find the more abundant grace abounding right there in all those places and the grace abound through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. <clears throat> then what did the law enter for? to bring us to Christ. Don't you see? Then whenever anybody in this world uses the Ten Commandments, when any sinner in this world uses the Ten Commandments for any other purpose than to reach Jesus Christ, what kind of a purpose is he putting them to? A wrong purpose. He is perverting the intent of God in giving the law, isn't he? to use the law of God with man for any other purpose, therefore, than that they may reach Christ Jesus is to use the law in a way that God never intended it to be used. A very bold statement, isn't it? That the law is to be used for just one purpose, and that is to get to Jesus Christ. Not for judging our brethren or sisters, not as, as something that we ourselves feel that we need to go and keep, but no, to get to Jesus. Then two years later at the General Conference Sessions of 1895, 
A.T. Jones made an even bolder statement. And he said, And man who is trying to seek life in keeping the Ten Commandments and teaching others to expect life by keeping the Ten Commandments, that is even yet the ministration of death. The ministration of death. To tell others to expect life by keeping the Ten Commandments is to be a minister of death. These are very bold words. However, the spirit of prophecy in Faith and Works, page 18, resounds a very similar thought. And here... Her words emphasize this fact. Faith and Works, page 18, paragraph 1. There is not a point that needs to be dwelt upon more earnestly, repeated more frequently, or established more firmly in the minds of all than the impossibility of fallen man meriting anything by his own Best good works. Salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. It doesn't matter how much you try and keep the Ten Commandments or how much you do keep the Ten Commandments, it will not merit you anything. In Romans 10, verses 3 and 4, Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome. And there he spoke of the Jews as being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. Last week we saw that that's the very thing that the Hebrews sought to do at Mount Sinai. God had promised them that he would make them a holy nation. But they said, we will do it. We will make ourselves holy. And when God spoke the Ten Commandments, they said, all that you have said, we, we will do it. They were ignorant of God's righteousness. And we saw last week that the law is the transcript of God's character. It is the expression of His righteousness, His right doing. And that law which they thought that they could do was given that they might realize that they could not do it. Because that law wanted God's righteousness. God's right doing. God's perfection. And we read from 1893 General Conference Bulletins last week, where A.T. Jones gives this beautiful description of how when the law comes to us, it comes to us and it says, I want righteousness. I want a perfect life. But it doesn't want our righteousness. The scriptures declare our righteousness is as filthy rags. The law wants God's righteousness. And was that not the very reason that Jesus came? The scriptures declare that he made himself of no reputation. And some of the versions read that he annihilated himself. He came and he completely emptied himself and said I can of my own self do nothing but who did the works who did he say did the works my father he doeth the works so Christ came and stood in our place completely emptied of himself and the father worked his righteousness within him and that was the gift of Jesus Christ. 
the gift of the righteousness, the right doing of God. From uh, 1893, where we read there last week, General Conference Bulletins. So then when we have Jesus, when we have received him by faith and the law stands before us, or we stand before it and he makes his wondrous demand, we can say, here it is. It is in Christ and he is mine. Do not the scriptures say that it is a gift of righteousness? God has given it to us. He has sent his son so that we can take his son, make him our own, and when the law of God comes and says, I want a perfect life, we can take his son, believe in his merits, appropriate his merits to ourselves, and that law, that law is perfectly satisfied. And the testimony in regard to the message given there at Minneapolis was that when he himself gives us the garment, the clothing, the character that fits us for the judgment, for the time of trouble, I could then see how he could come just as soon as he wanted to. Within two years. Because it was a gift. God had done everything for them. And God just wanted them to appropriate that gift to themselves. It was indeed a message that could prepare the people of God in a very quick time. A very quick time. But as we saw there, that they were in a state of confusion. They were all bound up with the law, the law. And even though Sister White had been preaching the same truth for 45 years, they had been missing the point. And so God had to send Jones and Wagner with a very unique experience and way of communicating the message to try and aid them in understanding the simplicity of it all. And it's interesting to note to what degree of simplicity A.T. Jones actually came to in the presentation of the subject of righteousness by faith. I want to read to you from, again from the 1893 General Conference Bulletins. And the speaking and the simplicity here probably couldn't get any plainer on the subject of righteousness by faith. You indeed will find this to be very interesting. Now he said, For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. What does that say? Abraham believed God and it. It. I. T. What? Believed God. His believing God, what did that amount to? Righteousness. Who counted it to him for righteousness? God. Well, did God make a mistake? No. Whether we understand it or not, the Lord did it. And he did right in doing it. He was perfectly just. He said so. We were not in the doing of it. We did not have the plan to lay. We could not have done it if we had tried anyway. Let us let him have his own way. I say again, brethren, when we let him have his own way are, we are, and we are in his own way, it will be all right and we need not be afraid. What was counted to Abraham for righteousness? He believed 
God. And God said, you are righteous, Abraham. Now that is said three times in that little short space. What was it that was counted to him for righteousness? His believing God. It. I-T. It. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. What was it that was counted unto Abraham for righteousness? He believed God. When God said a thing, Abraham believed it. He said, that is so. Was it that... What was it that the Lord said to him? Let us turn and read, because that is important to us. Genesis 15, 4 to 6. That we will read that. Genesis chapter 15, verse 4 to 6. Because what A.T. Jones is doing here, he's just simply reading the word of God as a little child. And are we not told that we must become as little children in order to enter the kingdom of heaven? Genesis chapter 15 Verses 4 to 6. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Now, do you believe that Abraham became righteous in just that way? Honestly now, do you? Do you know he did? The Lord called Abraham out and said, Look at the stars and tell the number of them. So shall thy seed be. Abraham said, Amen. That is the Hebrew. Abraham said, Amen. And the Lord said, You are right. Now do you know that it was as simple a transaction as that? Was it just like calling you and me out of this tabernacle and the Lord saying to us, See the stars? Tell the stars if they'll be able to number them. Yes, so shall such and such be. And we say, Amen. And he should say, You are righteous. Suppose the Lord called you and me out tonight. No, he can do it without calling us out. He called Abraham outdoors to show him the stars, but he can show Abraham us sins without calling us outdoors has he shown you a great many sins has he now he says if thou be able to number them they shall be as white as snow and what do you say amen then what does the lord say you are righteous. Are you? Do people become righteous as easy as that? Is it as simple a transaction as that? The congregation said yes. Amen. Thank the Lord. Now let us turn again to the fourth of Romans and get the particular verse where this is told. That was there we read in our scripture reading this morning. Romans 4 verses 23 and 24. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. See the plain speaking of the scriptures is for us today. 
<coughs> reading on. What the Lord said to Abraham, Abraham believed. And what he says to you and me, you and I believe, then we get the same results. It is not some particular thing that the Lord says that we must believe in order to be righteous. Whatever he says, believe it. And then he says, you are right. I would like to know whether it is not so. That when the Lord says a thing, he is right? Yes. Then when I say that is so, am I not right? What in the world hinders me from being right? Can you tell? I will say it again. When the Lord says a thing, is he right? Yes. He is right in saying it. Then when I say that is so, when I say amen, when I say be it so, when I say yes, that is so, then am I not right? Yes. Am I not right just as certainly as he is? Certainly. Can even he say, I am wrong? No. He says a thing, and I say the same thing. Can he say, I am wrong? When you say the same thing, can he say that you are wrong? No. Well then, when we are in such a situation that the Lord himself cannot say that you and I are wrong, I would like to know what in the world is the reason we are not right. And believing God puts us in just that situation as he did Abraham. I would like to know what can keep us out of heaven then. What can keep us out of the kingdom of God then? That's a good question then, isn't it? What can keep us out of the kingdom of God then? The only thing that can keep you and me out of the kingdom of God is to tell the Lord that he lies. And if you and I will stop that business, we will get into heaven all right. That is just what people need to do, to stop telling the Lord that he lies. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. But whoever would make God a liar is a liar himself, and liars cannot get into the kingdom of God. Then the thing we want to do is to stop lying. Let us quit right now. Stop lying. No difference what the Lord says. You say, that is so. Wow. Wow. Is there a plainness of speech there that is very rarely heard in the world today? If God says it, and you believe it, according to A.T. Jones, you're righteous. And it's that simple. Really? How do you think that the church in that day would have responded to such a message like that? Yeah, I believe they would have pulled out the following quote from 1886. And it comes from Six Bible Commentary, page 1073. And here, Sister White writes, God requires at this time just what he required of the holy pair in Eden. Perfect obedience to his requirements. His law remained the same in all ages. The great standard of righteousness presented in the Old Testament is not lowered in the New. It is not the work of the gospel to weaken the claims of God's holy law, but to bring men up 
where they can keep its precepts. The faith in Christ which saves, saves the soul is not what is represented to be by many. Believe, believe is their cry. Only believe in Christ and you will be saved. It's all you have to do. While true faith trusts wholly in Christ for salvation, it will lead to perfect conformity to the law of God. Faith is manifested by works. The Apostle John declares, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. Do you think they could have responded with such a statement as that? Because there was A.T. Jones saying, Abraham simply believed God. And he was saved. He was made righteous. Does it not sound similar to what Sister White is reciting here from the pulpits of many churches today? Believe. Just believe. That is all that you have to do. Was A.T. Jones wrong? Or was A.T. Jones right? What did Sister White have to say in regard to the very plain speaking of A.T. Jones? You know, she wrote him a letter. And uh, in that letter she gave him some counsel. And I want to read to you that letter. She starts off here. Brother A.T. Jones... I wish to call your attention to another matter. I was attending a meeting and a large congregation were present. In my dream, you were presenting the subject of faith and the imputed righteousness of Christ by faith. You repeated several times that works amounted to nothing, that there were no conditions. The matter was presented in that light that I knew minds would be confused and would not receive the correct impression in reference to faith and works. And I decided to write to you. <coughs> you state this matter too strongly. There are conditions to our receiving justification and sanctification and the righteousness of Christ, I know your meaning, but you leave a wrong impression upon many minds. While good works will not save even one soul, yet it is impossible for even one soul to be saved without good works. God saves us under a law that we must ask if we would receive, seek if we would find, and knock if if we would have the door opened unto us. Christ offers himself as willing to save unto the uttermost who come unto him. He invites all to come to him. You look in reality, you look in reality upon these subjects as I do. Yet you make these subjects, through your expressions, confusing to minds. The young man who came to Jesus with the question, Good Master, what shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Christ said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if you wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He said unto him, Which? Jesus quoted several, and the young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Here are conditions. And the Bible is full of conditions. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then when you say there are no conditions, and some expressions are made quite broad, Ye burden the minds, and some cannot see consistency in your expressions. 
they cannot see how they can harmonize these expressions with the plain statements of the Word of God. Please guard these points. These strong assertions in regard to works never make our position any stronger. Christ said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. I feel such an intense interest that every soul shall see and understand and be charmed with the consistency of the truth. The evidence of our love to Christ is not pretension, but practice. My brother, it is hard for the mind to comprehend this point, and do not confuse any mind with ideas that will not harmonize with the word. Please do consider that under the teaching of Christ, many of the disciples were lamentably ignorant. But when the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised came upon them and made the vacillating Peter the champion of faith. What a transformation in his character. But do not lay one pebble for a soul that is weak in the faith to stumble over in overwrought presentations or expressions. Be ever consistent, calm, deep, and solid. Do not go to any extreme in anything, but keep your feet on solid rock. O precious, precious Saviour, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that believeth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Written to A.T. Jones in respect to the messages that he was communicating. Interesting, isn't it? We just read previously from A.T. Jones where A.T. Jones said, just believe. Just believe. If God says it, whatever it is that he says, just say, Lord, amen, it is so. And you are righteous. God will count you as fit for his kingdom. And Sister Wyatt here gave him a warning. Be very, very careful what you say. It's interesting to note there that she actually said, she says, I know your meaning. You look in reality upon these subjects as I do. So was he wrong? No, he wasn't wrong. His meaning was right. What he meant to convey was the same reality that Sister White believed and taught herself. But then she said, what did she say? Please consider that under the teaching of Christ, many of the disciples were lamentably ignorant. There was a problem. She could understand what he was communicating. But the others, the others were getting confused. They had difficulties harmonizing his messages with the way they had previously read the word of God. The law, the law, the law was what they had been focusing on their whole Christian experience. And along came A.T. Jones and he says, if you're going to try and keep the law and tell people that you're going to be saved by keeping the law, you're a minister of death. And they got very uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. What was the issue? The issue was that the people were lamentably ignorant. She said, you look in reality upon the subjects as I do, but please be careful not to lay one pebble for a soul that is weak in the faith to stumble over. They were not yet ready to understand the simplicity of the message. His meaning was correct, but he was misunderstood. 
And the problem Sister White just defines very clearly here in Faith and Works, page 18, paragraph 1. And she wrote this in 1890. The danger has been presented to me again and again of entertaining as a people false ideas of justification by faith. I have been shown for years that Satan would work in a special manner to confuse the mind on this point. The law of God has been largely dwelt upon and has been presented to congregations almost as destitute of the knowledge of Jesus Christ as his relation to the law as was the offering of Cain. I have been shown that many have been kept from the faith because of the mixed confused ideas of salvation because the ministers have worked in a wrong manner to reach hearts. The point has been urged upon my mind for years is the imputed righteousness of Christ. I have wondered that this matter was not made the subject of discourses in our churches throughout the land when the matter has been kept so constantly urged upon me and I have made it the subject of nearly every discourse and talk that I have given to the people. In examining my writings 15 and 20 years old, I find that they present the matter in this same light, that those who enter upon the solemn sacred work of ministry should first be given a preparation in lessons upon the teachings of Christ and the apostles in living principles of practical godliness. They are to be educated in regard to what constitutes earnest living faith what was the problem the problem was that the ministers had been working in a wrong manner they had not educated the people in regard to what constitutes earnest living faith So as soon as A.T. Jones came along and said, believe, believe as Abraham believed, they misunderstood him. They misunderstood him. What did A.T. Jones mean when he said, believe. Sister White said, I know your meaning. <clears throat> it's exactly what I agree with. But the way you're expressing it, people are getting confused. And people were getting confused because they didn't understand what he meant when he taught what faith was. And in 1899, A.T. Jones makes it very clear what he meant when he speaks of Abraham's believing. And here, and it's actually from Lessons in Faith as well. <coughs> the knowledge of what... Sorry, he speaks Sister White there. And she says here, The knowledge of what the Scripture means when urging upon us the necessity of cultivating faith is more important than any other knowledge that can be attained. And we'll come back to that particular statement. But Sister White writes that the most important knowledge is what the Scriptures mean when it speaks of the necessity of cultivating faith. Then A.T. Jones defines faith here. Faith is the expecting the Word of God to do the thing which that word speaks. And the depending upon the word only to accomplish the thing which that word speaks. I'll read that again. Faith is the expecting the word of God to do the thing which that word speaks. 
and the depending upon the word only to accomplish the thing which that word speaks. Abraham is the father of all them which be of faith. The record of Abraham then gives instruction in faith, what it is and what it does for him who has it. What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the faith has found? What saith the scripture? When Abraham was more than 80 years old and Sarai his wife was old and he had no child, God brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And Abraham believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Abraham accepted the word of God and expected by the word what the word said. And in that, he was right. He believed... In fact, come here, come to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, reading of the faith of Abraham. The Apostle Paul spells it out for us very clearly here. Romans chapter 4. Verse 18 through to 21 and 22. Speaking of Abraham, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness what did A.T. Jones say <coughs> Abraham accepted the word of God and expected by the word what the word said and in that he was right. When God came to him and he said, So shall thy seed be, Abraham's faith was a belief that God would fulfill his word. We know the scripture there in Isaiah 55, where it says that, My word shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish the things whereunto I sent it. Abraham's faith laid hold of of that reality, that it, the word, would produce the very thing itself. And so it is, back to this message of righteousness by faith. We meet the law. We realize that the righteousness of God contained in the law is something that we do not have to give. It's not in ourselves. And yet we see our miserable lives. We see that everything we do is full of iniquity. And we cry out, Oh, who shall deliver me from the condemnation of this law? I don't have what it wants. I've just, just got these Filthy garments of my own right doing. And then Jesus comes to us and he says, Here. Here is my life, a perfect life. A life which is full of the working of God. Take it. Believe it. Believe that it's yours. And if we will do that, if we will do it, then Steps to Christ, page 62, paragraph 2. Christ's character stands in place of your character and you are accepted before God just as if you 
had not sinned. Is that not how we find forgiveness? God comes to us. I forgive you. Here is my son, a propitiation for the remission of sins that are past. And what do we do? Well, we believe it, don't we? We don't bother waiting for a happy flight of feelings because we know that the f- feelings will not justify us. Feelings aren't going to bring us forgiveness. We've only got one option, that is to say, okay, Lord, if that's the way it is, I'm in. And Steps to Christ, page 50, Sister White describes exactly that just here. From the simple Bible account of how Jesus healed the sick, we may learn something about how to believe in him for the forgiveness of sins. Let us turn to the story of the paralytic at Bethesda. The poor sufferer was helpless. He had not used his limbs for 38 years, yet Jesus bade him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. The sick man might have said, Lord, if thou wilt make me whole, I will obey thy word. But no, he believed Christ's word, believed that he was made whole, and he made the effort at once. He willed to walk, and he did walk. He acted on the word of Christ and God gave the power. He was made whole. In like manner, you are a sinner. You cannot atone for your past sins. You cannot change your heart and make yourself holy. But God promises to do all this for you through Christ. You believe that promise? You confess your sins and give yourself to God? You will to serve him? Just as surely as you do this, God will fulfill his word to you. If you believe the promise, believe that you are forgiven and cleansed, God supplies the fact. You are made whole, just as Christ gave the paralytic power to walk when the man believed that he was healed. It is so if you believe it. Well, she's speaking just as plainly as A.T. Jones here, isn't she? (coughs) Do not wait to feel that you are made whole, but say, I believe it. It is so, not because I feel it, but because God has promised. And God supplies the fact. Now, the big issue with A.T. Jones' plain speaking was that they couldn't see past the justification point. They can see, okay, all right then, um, the declaration of Christ's righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, that's fine. But what did we read before? We read that there are conditions. There is a change There is a practical holiness that needs to be evident in the life. And Jones' message didn't seem to harmonize with that. But Sister White said, I know what you mean. And it's exactly the way I understand it as well. One thing that Christianity today is so quick to forget or overlook is (coughs) what righteousness is. Righteousness is right doing. So when we speak of righteousness by faith, we're not just talking about an aura of holiness or just a sense of holiness or just a legal transaction. We are talking about something that is practical in the life itself. It was a message given in 1888, which was right doing by faith. Right doing by faith. 
But because the people didn't understand how it was that faith works, they choked on A.T. Jones's words. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 communicates to us the very basic principle. We have received Jesus Christ, how? By taking God at his word and simply believing that he means what he says and he will produce the fact. Now here, Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. How did you receive forgiveness for your sins? By taking God at his word. By believing that he will fulfill his word to you. So just as you have received Christ, so walk ye in him. Continue to take God at his word. God gives you the promise. Rely and depend upon him to supply the fact. Christ Object Lessons, page 61, paragraph 2. Our part, our part, and don't we want to know what our part is because God's not going to do everything for us. It's described as a cooperation where God works and man works. Well, what is man's works? Our part is to receive God's word and to hold it fast yielding ourselves fully to its control and its purpose in us will be accomplished. What is our part? To believe. To believe that the word of God will accomplish the thing itself. And so when the law of God comes to us and it says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, It's a promise. It's the word of God with the power in it to accomplish itself in our lives. Then when he comes, it comes and it says, Thou shalt not lie. We are to receive that word as having power in itself to keep us from lying. You know what was written of Jesus there in Psalms 119? I don't have the reference. But there the psalmist writes. And Sister White quotes as being of Christ in Desire of Ages. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word have I hid in my heart. That I might not sin. Because that word itself would accomplish the fact itself. And when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, what was his answer? It is written. It is written. And that was his defense. That was his power to overcome. Because the faith of Jesus, which was the faith of Abraham, took God at his word, believed that God would keep his word. And one of the very last articles that Sister White ever wrote for any publication, she wrote this here. And it comes from the Bible Training School, June 1, 1915. The very year that Sister White died. And she writes here regarding faith. The work of faith means more than 
we think. It means genuine reliance upon the naked word of God. Means what? Genuine reliance upon the naked word of God. By our actions we are to show that we believe that God will do just as he has said. By what? By our actions. We are called to live a holy life. We can. Because God has promised to keep us holy. He has promised that we will have no other gods before him. He has promised that we shall not lie. He has promised that we shall not covet. This is his word. And if we believe it, then by our actions we will show that we believe that God will do just as he has said. The wills of nature and of providence are not appointed to roll backward nor to stand still. We must have an advancing working faith, a faith that works by love and purifies the soul from every vestige of selfishness. It is not self, but God, that we must depend upon. We must not cherish unbelief. We must have that faith that takes God at his word. Faith that takes God at his word. And if we will have that faith, if we will have a faith that will say, Amen, to whatever God says. God will call us righteous because that word is going to produce the thing. And the other thing that Apostle Paul writes there in Romans 4 is that God counts those things that aren't as though they are. So in the one year of probation that was given to the church, they, God knew that the word would produce the thing because it doesn't return unto him void. And it was interesting as I was preparing this particular sermon today, I kept on wanting to go down in my mind and in the research and study of different aspects of the whole message. Justification, sanctification, but each time I tried to do so, I kept on coming up against a block. And that block was the fact that it is righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith. It doesn't matter how clear we might be on all of the other subjects. If we haven't understood faith... When God comes to us as plainly as A.T. Jones did in 1893, what will our reaction be? <clears throat> hmm. I'm not too sure about that. And we'll pull out the same quote from 1886. Why? Because we haven't understood what it means to believe. Review and Herald, October 18, 1898. Paragraph 7. Sister White writes this. At nine o'clock I attended a meeting of the students in the school chapel. About 80 were present and the room was full. An hour was occupied in reading and in talking to them about the necessity of their understanding how to exercise faith. This, this is the science of the gospel. The scripture declares, without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
the knowledge of what the scripture means when urging upon us the necessity of cultivating faith is more essential than any other knowledge that can be acquired. We suffer much trouble and grief because of our unbelief and our ignorance of how to exercise faith. We must break through the clouds of unbelief. We cannot have a healthy Christian experience. We cannot obey the gospel unto salvation until the science of faith is better understood and until more faith is exercised. There can be no perfection of Christian character without that faith that works by love and purifies the soul. What is more essential than any other knowledge? Do you know what it means to exercise faith? You know, the question was asked by the jailer to Apostle Paul. What must I do to be saved? What did Apostle Paul say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe. Only believe. Yes. But we need to understand what the scriptures mean when they say believe. The Lord gave his people a precious message through Elders Jones and Wagner. But the church never received the message. Not just because of the pride, the human pride in the ministers, but the members of the church missed out on it because they had not been educated in regard to the very principle, fundamental principles of faith. Manuscript releases, volume 8, 2221. The angel said, Some tried too hard to believe. Is this your problem? Do you get confused as to what it means when the word of God says believe? Some tried too hard to believe, said the angel. Faith is so simple, you look above it. Have we been doing that our whole entire life? Could it be that today we are missing the point simply because we don't understand the science of faith? After all, the message was righteousness by faith. We can focus so much on righteousness and all the right doing. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Of the 1888 message, Sister White wrote this in closing. This comes from 1888 Materials 281, paragraph 1. The religion of Jesus Christ has not been as clearly defined as it should be. That the souls who are seeking for the knowledge of the plan of salvation may discern the simplicity of faith. In these meetings, the meetings of Jones and Wagner, in these meetings this has been made so clear that a child may understand that it is an immediate, voluntary, trustful surrender of the heart to God, a coming into union with Christ in confidence, affectionate obedience to do all his commandments through the merits of Jesus Christ. It is a decisive act of the individual committing to the Lord the keeping of the soul. Committing to who? <laughs> to the Lord. Trusting that he will fulfill his word. It is the climbing up by Christ, clinging to Christ, accepting the righteousness of Christ as a free gift. The will is to be surrendered to Christ through faith in the righteousness of Christ 
is salvation. In our first message, we looked at how it is that the Lord needs to speak to us more and more simply. But if the God comes to us today and speaks to us even more simply than he did in 1893, could we miss it? Simply because we haven't educated ourselves in regard to faith? May God help us to come to the point where we know by experience what it means to believe. Where it doesn't matter whatever God says. He means what he says. He himself will do what he says. Don't the scriptures say it is God who worketh in you both to will and to do? What does it say before that? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What was the work? Our part. Our working out of our salvation is to lay hold of the word of God. To resign ourselves to its workings. And whatever the Lord says, we can say, Amen. Let it be. And God will supply the fact. Next week we'll take this formula and we'll apply it to the truth for this generation. But until then, may God help us to be as little children. If Daddy says so, then it is so. Amen.